Welcome to Real Vision, Lenora Hawkins. It's very good to talk to you. Thanks. Great to talk to you. Yeah, now we've spoken before in the past, and I know you as L, so you don't mind if I, I, I use that name. You, you're the chief macro strategist at Tematica, aren't you? Yes, yes. And, and I like L better anyways. <laughs> yes, good. Um, you know, you're over in, uh, in Italy right now uh, in lockdown, and I, I think that's one of the reasons that I wanted to talk to you, because not only do you have a very considered uh, macro view on economics, but you're also in the middle of, of things that are going on right there. Yeah, talk about being in the epicenter, the epicenter you never really want to be in. Um, yeah, we've been in lockdown. This is now for the, the majority of the country. We're in the fourth week of lockdown. And they've been, over time, tightening it more and more. Uh, a couple weeks ago, we went from just lockdown, social distancing and all that, but you could still go out for a run to where now you can't even take a walk or go for a run. And all the other thing you can do is go out for groceries or for medication. That's it. And uh, they're not letting, like, if they see anybody over, like, 70, they get very upset when they see them outside. It's like, no, get other people to go get your your things for you. You know, I want to talk about all of that. Uh, but, you know, I, I actually, I want to go way back to uh, what brought you over to Italy and, yeah. and your journey that came there and, uh, and to Matica and so forth, just to give uh, viewers on Real Vision a sense of who you are and and uh, why you're in, in the old country, so to speak. Yeah, very much the old country. <laughs> well, I was in, before I came here, and I, I still have a base in San Diego, but was it 2012, I got an opportunity to join a family office that was fairly newly formed. Um, it was a, a family that had sold a couple businesses and were in the billions, and they built a family office, and a friend of mine from business school was our chief investment officer and was kind of struggling dealing with only Italians, when an awful lot of the investments that the family were getting involved with involved a partnership with Americans, with American hedge funds or so on. And and they also just, just needed to, to know not, not just how they worked, but just to think how they think. And he also wanted to create a family office that was a little bit more of a hybrid between your more traditional European and the, the more American. So I I took the leap. It was a time in my life where I was ready for a change. So I took the leap and came to Italy and I was able to keep my job um, as a, um, with Tematica, chief investment strategist there. I was able to keep that kind of work going. Um, at the time I was doing some other stuff, but similar, just a different company. I was able to keep that work and found that it was really actually very helpful and kind of augmented my perspective because instead of being just in the U.S. and and trying to have a, an international viewpoint on things, because if you're talking macro, you have to be able to appreciate what's going on all over the world. I actually got to be in meetings with major players on the international stage, making big decisions, seeing what's going on out there, like involved in, say, an Italian bank that's really struggling. And so hearing what's going on with the ECB, things like that really give me a, a better flavor for it. Because it's one thing if you read about it, it's another thing if you're living it entirely. Right. Yeah. It, it, without a doubt. And, and of course, you know, that goes back to your living uh, it, so to speak, yeah, right now in terms of uh, in Italy. You know, uh, before we had this interview, we spoke on the telephone about that, too. And you told me the story of when you found out that they were moving to the extreme lockdown, that you were actually on a run. But uh, tell that story. I thought that was interesting. Yeah, it was. So they, they, they put us on the lockdown like over a weekend. And then I think it was like a, two weeks later, I'm out going for a run. And at this point, it went, it was amazing. It went within a couple of weeks, it went from where you didn't, you didn't see anybody acting differently. Like everything was normal. And within a couple of weeks, it went from that to where everybody outside is wearing a mask. People are staying really far away from each other. It's that kind of look when you see someone where it's, hi, we're kind of in this together, we're all sort of commiserating, but at the same time, I'd really appreciate it if you stay far away. <laughs> and I'm out on a run, and I'm by myself, you know, far away from everyone, and the police actually pulled me over and told me that I had to go back, and at that point, weren't allowed to be more than 200 meters from home. I mean, 200 meters, what are you going to do? And it that day, everything really changed. That was like two weeks ago. It got really bad, and now, at night... 
Um, you really don't, you can't really be outside. I mean, there's so many police and military cruising the streets, which is just, it's just a, a bizarre thing, right? You're imprisoned and being patrolled by police and army and you haven't done anything wrong. Right. That is bizarre. And they, are they taking precautions in terms of, you know, like they have the masks and when they come up to you and so forth? Oh, yeah. They're they're completely masked up, gloves and everything. What's, I think, probably the most disturbing thing is uh, when you go to the grocery store, it's first you have to stand in line for hours, literally, because they're only letting a few people in at a time. So if there's like 20 people trying to go to the grocery store, it's going to take a very long time. And you can't go together. People have to go just one person. You stand in these lines that are like six, seven feet apart from one another. And then the guy who's at the entrance to the grocery store, he's literally in a complete hazmat suit with goggles and the mask and everything. And they check your temperature as you approach the door before they'll even let you in. They're checking your temperature. And then when you get in, there's employees of the grocery store fully hazmat suited out with the goggles and the glasses and the masks and everything. And they are following everyone around, you know, all like three people in a massive grocery store. And everywhere you go, they're scrubbing right behind and spraying and disinfecting everywhere you go. It is. Wow. I don't know how we ever forget this, you know, how it doesn't permanently change the way we all live. And the U.S. is going to be facing this soon. I mean, New York is is already dealing with it. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, when we spoke, it was probably a week ago or so, and we hadn't gotten to that point in, yeah. in the United States. But, you know, the numbers of cases per day in the U.S. are now the, the most. I mean, your your trajectory is actually flattening. So talk about flattening the curve, the stuff that you're doing now. It sounds like that's having a, a, a measured impact. Well, when, so we went into the lockdown um, because the thing, the, the, the measure that you really need to watch is called the R naught. And that's basically the rate of contagion. So if you have an R naught of two, then that means on average, every person who has the virus is going to give it to two people. And you can understand if you have an R naught of one, you're going to kind of have the percent of the population that has it is going to, you know, it's not going to accelerate. If you have it above one, that's a big problem because you're going to get more and more of the population having it. We had an R naught of about 2.3 to 2.7 right when they did the lockdown. Right now, a little over four, like four weeks in, our R naught is down to about, they think about 1.2. And they're mm. estimating that it's going to be 0.7 by Easter. So that's when they can start to, to open up things. A um, couple interesting things that we've we've seen here, though, and, and you were saying that our case count, so our our peak net new cases was March 21st. So that was a little, like two and a half weeks in, we had the peak number of new cases. Uh, the And ever since then, we've been going down. I mean, it's not been like a solid, consistent every single day down, but on average, it continues to keep, keep dropping. So that's great. And the number of deaths, now the deaths also rolled over. That took a little bit longer. It was about a week later before the deaths really started to, to roll over. So there's some good signs there as well. But something that's um, some interesting data that recently has been released is looking at the total number of deaths in Italy in 2020 compared to each of the past five years. Mm -hmm. And what they've found is that for every COVID death, you had an extra one and a half to 1.8 additional deaths beyond what you normally have every year. And the population of Italy hasn't changed so dramatically. So you should be seeing roughly the same kind of deaths year after year. So say if you have like a, a hundred COVID deaths for every hundred COVID deaths, there was an additional 50 to 80 deaths beyond what you would see in a typical year. And that's across all of Italy. And if you go into Bergamo, which was the hardest hit, for every 100 deaths, you had an additional 220 deaths that are above what you would normally see. So what that is telling us is that is probably a combo of these, that there are some additional deaths that aren't being coded to a COVID death. For example, you know, somebody passes away at home and they don't swab after the person has passed away so that they can identify this as a COVID debt. But also what we're probably seeing, and this was the big concern, is also that massive stress that gets put 
on the medical care here. And that's what really pushed the lockdown because you run out of hospital beds, right? And this is everybody in the States is seeing this um, now with what's going on in New York. You're seeing it in Spain. Spain's just getting crushed under this. And for a little perspective on this to just to point out, because we did run into a huge problem with hospital beds here in Italy um, and with, with ventilators, you know, people have been hearing about that. And just so that people don't think it's that Italy has, you know, some sort of inferior medical system, there are 3.2 hospital beds in Italy for every thousand person, people. So 3.2 beds for every thousand. The United States has 2.7. Right. And if we're looking at doctors, Italy has 4.1 doctors for every thousand persons, whereas the U.S. has 2.7. So 4.1 to 2.7. So it's not that Italy, you know, is just underfunded in the healthcare sector. Interesting. You know, and when you, when you mentioned Spain and Bergamo, it immediately made me think of when we were talking, you talked about a, a Champions League match yeah. that was what you would, might call a super spreader, you know, the yes. Mardi Gras of, of Italy. I think it was Atalanta against Valencia. And uh, tell me what what have people ascertained about that match and why that matters? Yeah, so we had, you know, we'd, we'd all heard about uh, South Korea had that, I think it was patient like 31, the super spreader who was at a church function and just got a ton of people sick from that one event. Well, they were, people were asking, you know, why did Italy get hit so hard? And then why did Spain get hit so hard following that? And it's a little strange. I mean, part is because Italy has some fairly close ties with actually with Wuhan. You have direct flights from Milan to Wuhan. But that didn't really explain this explosion that we saw here. And what they think is that there was a very similar event to the, the South Korea super spreader where we had that soccer tournament between a, a team from Bergamo, Atalantia, and a team from Spain, Valencia. Now, the game was just too big of a game and so, so many people wanted to watch it that they couldn't host it in Bergamo. So it was held in Milan. I mean, you, so you have this huge match in Milan tons of people at it. And they think that there were enough people who were sick at that game that you ended up having this huge spread of the virus, right? Because everybody comes to see the games. So there's like tens of thousands of people. And then they go back to Spain and they go back to Bergamo, which explains why Bergamo got hit so much harder than anybody else. Right. Yeah, that is, uh, you know, I mean, it's very unfortunate. And also it tells you, as I was saying, you know, Mardi Gras, that tells you how these things, you know, people come together, then they go yeah. out and, and then they spread the disease. So that's where, that, that's where the U.S. is going. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I want to uh, use uh, uh, we could talk for hours. I, I mean, I could talk to you for hours about uh, about this. You're being in lockdown because you were telling me how you have access to the roof and you can run around and so forth. I mean, it's just fascinating to, to hear about the lockdown situation. But you're an economist. You know what impact this has on the economy and also what the political economy. And I think yeah. that those are the two things that are most interesting for me. Uh, when you think about the economic and the political impacts of uh, coronavirus, what comes to mind first for you where you are right now? Well, there's a couple of things. So to start with, one of the, the big challenges right now, um, the U.S. is talking about this, Spain's talking about it. Um, Italy's a little bit further ahead on the curve, right, having been hit harder earlier. The problem we're facing, it's, it's akin to having a bunch of people. You've got like Italy's population, about 60 million people. Well, you got 60 million people sitting on a plane on the tarmac going, when the hell do we get off? And you know how it drives you nuts when they don't tell you, when no one says anything about when you're gonna get off the damn plane? That's what we're having right now. We're really struggling with getting some, some decent communication on what the plan is. You know, How are we gonna start to open up the economy? What's the, uh, the timeline? They've started getting a little bit better about it because without that, you know, how do businesses plan? If you if you know you're going to be locked down for a month versus four months, a couple of weeks, you know, you're, you're going to handle the situation differently. So one of the things that really needs to happen everywhere is governments need to do a better job of communicating, and that will help the economy as well because people can kind of have in their head, all right, here's what I need to do to to get through this. Um, We've had a couple of difficult things as well here with uh, some of them are a little bit funny. So yesterday, April 1st, and it's 
sort of fun that it was on April Fool's Day. On April Fool's Day was the first day in Italy that you could apply to get a 600 euro a month aid for those people who, you know, they're out of work, they need to make ends meet. About 4 million people went to the website to try and do this. And the website kept crashing. And on top of crashing, it was also occasionally popping up other pers- other people's personal information. Wow. So, I mean, that's, and that's kind of par for the course for the Italian government. Now, can't really knock that because the U.S. had some similar issues with the launch of Obamacare. But that's some of the, you know, some of the frustrations. But uh, a little bit of a humorous note was somebody tweeted out about how it's um, why they prefer the private sector to the public sector. It's like four million hits to the Italian help website and it crashes. 400 million people going to Pornhub, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> Pornhub, of course, then tweeted to the Italians that they would be willing to help the government with their servers. <laughs> so right. <laughs> got that going for us, right? Um, so far, we haven't had some really great data on what the actual unemployment hit has been. Uh, Italy doesn't do the weekly the way the U.S. does. And right in the U.S., we've seen just absolutely astronomical record increases in the first claim, first initial filings for unemployment. The Italy, we will get that in a couple days because um, they just do by month. And February's data, starting out, I mean, it wasn't that great. It was great in Italy terms. But it wasn't great compared to where you'd like it to be because unemployment um, was already at like 9.7 percent. So it's not like we're starting off at a really good point. Right. Yeah. What what do you make of uh, those numbers? Because we were talking about this just before we came on. That You had a 3.2 that became a 3.3 and then you had a 6.6. By the way, these are seasonally adjusted and obviously seasonal adjustments don't really matter because, you know, the the magnitude is so large that it swamps any seasonal adjustments. The real number was 5.8. Still, nonetheless, that's an enormous number. Uh, In the market, it's, you know, futures sold off a little bit in the U.S. uh, in in wake of in the wake of this. But generally speaking, the market tone is, is relatively positive. How do you reconcile that? I think a good part of that is what's going on um, with Trump tweeting about the oil market. And I think the market's in for a big disappointment because looking at his numbers, he's implying that Russia and Saudi Arabia are going to cut their production roughly in half and the U.S. isn't going to do anything. I don't really see Russia and Saudi Arabia basically agreeing to kind of subsidize the American shale oil sector. So I don't think we're going to get the numbers that he's talking about. Um, I can't imagine that Saudi Arabia and Russia are not at some point going to go, all right, you know, we both need to blink. This hurts. This is hurting all of us. I mean, we're, we're hitting the point with oil where there's literally no place to put it. And it's not like these are things that you can just go turn on and go, I mean, I'm going to turn it off for a couple of hours, right? I mean, this is, this is big commitment to, to increasing capacity or decreasing capacity. Um, and so I think the, the market got all excited about that. Plus there's, I think the market still has this belief that if it's really, really bad, the government can come in and do something. Right. And and that to me is the most terrifying belief. You have that belief in Italy as well, although it's not really directed exactly at the Italian government, that the Italian government is going to save the day. It's more that the European Union will come and save the day. And the degree to which that is possible is decidedly suspect, to say the least. So let's kind of take a look at, at where Italy's situation at the moment. And right. just to, to kind of give Italy a little bit of credit, it's not like Italy's economy is about one-tenth the size of the U.S. So it's GDP, about one-tenth of the U.S., where it has about one-fifth of the population, right? So that that's pretty weak. That doesn't sound so good. On the plus side, Italy's actually, their labor participation rate is higher than the U.S. It's 65.5%, where the U.S. is 63.4%. So there's actually more people in Italy looking to work. The unemployment rate here is much higher at 9.7%. But the real problem here is the amount that the government is already involved in the economy. Government spending actually accounts for 48.4% of the economy. So that's a Half of the economy comes from the government spending. 
And one of the dirty little secrets about that is that government spending gets counted whether the company, so uh, the government hires the company to do something, right? To build a bridge. We've had a problem. We've had some problems with, with bridges lately. They don't actually give the cash to the company. They give an IOU. Right. But the spending gets counted even though the company hasn't received it. So there's actually a huge market in Italy for companies to go to the banks and say, okay, I have this payable from the government. They've owed me for like a year. Can the bank please lend me the money? Okay, well then the banks, the government's like, yes, you should lend the money. Okay, so the banks lend the money, but you get into this spiral, right? That's that's a really bad situation to be in. And we're already, so we're already dealing with a country that a, almost half of the economy is government spending and they're not even paying. Right. Tough to run a business, right? Pay your employees, have your employees be able to buy stuff and have the economy going when they're not getting paid. Now but what the hell are you they doing? Are, they're being paid in fiat money, if you think about it, because isn't that what fiat money is? It's yeah. just an IOU. I mean, this yeah. is... This is even worse. This right, is like a fiat were, on a fiat. <laughs> As, as you were speaking, I was thinking to myself, uh, you know, that redenomination risk, redenomination risk. That's the, yeah. the, the word that came into or the phrase that came into my head. Yeah. And I was thinking to myself, how long has this been going on with these IOUs? Because at the end of the day, that's how you redenominate is you redenominate via a IOU that allows you to therefore say these are now lira. These are, uh, are you know, real money. This is uh, we're going to move from the euro to these IOUs. And that is definitely the threat, right? Because Italy can look at the eurozone. It was one thing. The eurozone's already been rocked by Brexit. You know, that was pretty ugly. The the UK had been part of the European Union, not the eurozone with the unified currency, but part of the European Union for decades. So this is a massive, massive rejection. And to have Italy then fall out, it's a pretty good threat, right? Oh, yeah. Europe's not going to, is really not going to want that. But let's look at how good the Eurozone's actually been for Italy. Now, not saying that it's the Eurozone doing this, but while Italy's been in the Eurozone, things haven't gone that well. And we've all heard about how Greece, right? We had the, the Grexit because Greece was a, a complete disaster. Well, since the start of the Eurozone, Greece's per capita GDP in, in constant currency has gone up 3.1%. That's pretty bad. I think 20 years and his <laughs> GDP per capita has gone up three. I mean, that's like over 20 years, your pay increased 3%, not per year, but totally. So that that's that's kind of ugly. Well, 3.1 looks pretty damn good when you're looking at Italy, which has seen its per capita GDP drop by 2.1%. I mean, in no other country in the Eurozone, no other major country has seen anything like that. For comparison, over that same time period, you've got the U.S. per capita GDP up 24.6%. Ireland knocked it out of the ballpark. They're up nearly 80%, right? right. So, And Germany, who's the one that kind of does a lot of the finger wagging, they kind of hold the purse strings, they're up 24.6%, uh, kind of around the same as the U.S., and yet Italy has gone down. Now, part of that is argued to be because the Eurozone, with the stronger northern economies, you create a currency that is stronger than it would be if it was just the southern guys, right, that are less productive. So Italy's exchange rate is higher than it should be. So it's ex it exports less and its imports are, are more are difficult, right? Like it's it's tough on the economy when your currency is too valued too high, right? That's what you do when you want to get your economy going, devalue your currency against everyone else, and suddenly your stuff's cheap. Well, Italy has been facing that headwind, but there's more to it than that. You know, that's a pretty easy answer. And, and right now, the push is for these the floating of euro bonds. Okay, so you float these euro bonds, and then you give more money to the Italian government to spend so what the Italian government's going to count for like 60, 70 percent of GDP, because we're already almost at 50 percent. I mean, that that how is that going to work out and how can the private sector, because it's the private sector that has to generate the wealth to pay those bonds. Right. It's not the public sector. Public sector creates no wealth. 
It just takes wealth from other places and spends it. You have to have the private sector. Well, the private sector is down to like 30, 40%. How the hell is this going to possibly work? So there's people thinking, oh, well, we can just, you know, we'll, we'll borrow money, we'll euro bonds, it'll be fine, and we'll just keep doing the same old, same old. It isn't going to work. The problem but is much, much bigger. It's not even going to work politically, because that's, that, that, that's where the story comes into play. The real story is that as we speak now, uh, you have a contingent of southern European economies, the four, uh, Portugal, Spain, Greece, and Italy, uh, and then you have four northern economies, uh, that's Finland, uh, Austria, the Netherlands, and Germany, uh, basically tete-a-tete -tete with each other. Yeah. The last that I've heard about the euro bonds is that uh, there's a contingent of even the likes of Latvia, actually, interestingly enough, are moving into the southern European camp with France as the as the, the kingmaker. Yeah. So from my perspective, it seems like we're at a pivotal moment in the re-denomination risk game yeah. with uh, people like Mark Rutte, who's the head of the Dutch government saying, under no circumstances are we changing our position. Where does this, where does this go, this whole euro bond versus ESM debate? I think it is going to be very, very difficult to actually get this through and make it work. Italy's debt to GDP is already 132%. That is part of what's crippling the economy. The government is a massive portion of the economy, and there's a massive amount of debt sitting on the economy. You cannot solve this problem by dumping more debt on it. And I don't see how other economies that have been doing quite well are going to be willing to put this basically a big old cement block and tie it to their feet while they try to swim across the sea. You know, that's just, I don't see that being politically all that feasible. The problem is you have this mentality that government will solve the problem when the problem is, in fact, the government. So I think this is going to get really ugly. I think there's either one or two things is going to happen. You're either going to have significant fiscal consolidation, fiscal policy consolidation, which means that Italy is no longer nearly as autonomous as it used to be. Its finances are going to be run more and more by Brussels. Now, some would argue that that might be a good idea because it's not like Italy has this fantastic track record. But history pretty much is clear that when you have some guy over there making decisions for a guy over here, that doesn't tend to go very well because you're, you don't have any skin in the game, right? You're not you're not dealing with the consequences of your own decisions. So that's but unlikely to, to work out well. Said, even Conti has said that's that's a that's a deal breaker. Just yeah. like Bratta is saying it's a deal breaker to do a euro bond. Yeah. The Italian government is saying they would never do that. So yeah, that's, at, like, that's completely at, the only out. options. And you've got half the people saying no way on option A and the other half going no way on option B. And it's like, those are the only options. The other thing you can do is Italy falls out of the Eurozone, goes back to the lira. Probably, well, definitely it would need to have a big default on the debts. And that is also literally nearly impossible. I don't know how you even do that. How would Italy, so they default, they can't borrow any money. They they have an old population. It's the second oldest population in the world. First is Japan. Italy's got the oldest in Europe. How are you going to take care of all these people, these pensions, when you drop out of the Eurozone and you cannot borrow any more money? So there's, there's all bad all bad options around, and the clock is ticking. So part of the work I do here now is involved in having Italian companies, some private, some public, that are looking to perhaps have a strategic acquisition, be acquired, or get funding from primarily from uh, American companies. And what we're seeing is a lot of the big private equity companies, names that you would all know, they're looking at their portfolios right now as you know the world is coming to a grinding halt and saying, we know we're going to have to take losses. So where are we willing to take them and where will we provide additional capital? Because right now it's not like you're looking at a company saying, well, I'm going to invest uh, for, for growth. What you're doing is you're putting right. money in to keep it afloat, right? That's going to be the focus. So if you're doing that, you're going to have to say, all right, we're going to have to let some of these go. Italy, 
is probably one of the worst looking at the moment. So you've got capital, investing capital, no longer coming into the economy. And that is just accelerating this pace. I um, have a, a company that last year got them some emergency funding. It's a publicly traded company. They needed, they were in a, a tough spot, needed some emergency funding, got them that. Things were going great. They're back on their feet. And after this, and it's a consumer products company, after this, they're running out of time. And you're not talking just about a small company. This is a publicly traded company that has a couple months at most before it's completely out of cash. And that is the story everywhere here. And where is the money going to come from? But let me ask you this. Uh, how does that compare uh, from your uh, knowledge to what uh, UK companies are facing in terms of Brexit? From my perspective, it seems like Brexit is a easier scenario yeah. by far than uh, Ital exit would be yes, much easier. Well, the UK doesn't have the it doesn't have the percent of government. I think uh, their government spending is like thirty. I think on about thirty eight percent of GDP. So government accounts for a much smaller portion of the economy, and they also don't have the outrageous debt to GDP, and they have just a stronger economy that's got. There's a lot more faith in in their economy and how it operates. Here, you've got it's it's actually very difficult to speak of the Italian economy because you've got two very distinct economies. Mm -hmm. You have the North, which is where I am, and thank God we ended up being the epicenter because this is a very wealthy part of the, of the country. Things work really well here. There's a lot of GDP generated here. Then you have the bottom half. You go Ro Rome, go south. When you go down there, it, it's a completely different world, very, very poor and there you end up with some of these perfect examples of what is so wrong with the country where you have like more guys that work in basically their version of fish in game in the southern parts than you have in in huge parts of the United States. I mean, it's just it makes no sense. You have government just paying people to do nothing because they don't know what else to do. <laughs> So where, where do we go from here, not just in Italy, but also uh, globally and from an economic perspective? I mean, to game out different scenarios, obviously, you have to almost be a virologist at this point mm -hmm. in time because, you know, A, you have to understand, you know, uh, w when's this going to end? And you already yeah. talked about not getting any clear signals from that. B, you have to understand what the policy response is going to be. And then yeah. C... You have to get a sense of what the backside economic uh, damage is going to be. But if you could game out, you know, uh, sort of best case, yeah. medium and worst case scenarios for Italy and and other places that you're interested in, uh, what would you say? Well, I think what we are what we've seen out of the ECB, um, I think they're going they're going to pull out all the stops. They're going to come up with everything they can possibly come up with. I think Germany is not going to be able to fight back the way it has been. Um, Angela Merkel, I think, is she knows you just can't have Italy fall out. They've at least got to give it a shot. Um, one good thing, uh, Salvini, who he's the leader of what used to, it's Lega, and Lega is the much more nationalistic, very anti-EU group. He's got a lot less power than he had a couple years ago, so that's that's a good thing to kind of help that relationship along. There's talk here. Um, we'll see if it comes to pass, but there's a lot of talk of scrapping the current government, which there's precedent for this in a crisis. Remember last time, great financial crisis, they basically scrapped the Italian government and they put Draghi in charge. There's talk of that happening again. And I think that would actually be probably the best case scenario. I mean, the the, the leadership here right now, it, it's just, it's stunningly bad. I, for example, the when they tightened down the, the lockdown rules, how that all panned out was Conti, the prime minister, got on Facebook at 11 o'clock at night on a Saturday, no pre-announcement, just gets on Facebook, starts telling everybody, here's the rules, except for the rules hadn't really been agreed to. So that was Saturday saying, well, if you're not essential, only essential people can go to work on Monday. By Monday morning, people had no idea if they should go to work or not. I mean, that's just one little example. And I already told you about the website. I mean, this, 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 this government is not getting it done. We need to have an adult in charge. So hopefully we do get Draghi in. I think that would be a really, really good move for the country. And I think it would be good for the European Union. 
to get him in. I think Christine Lagarde, having her be put in the ECB, I think that was a very big sign that they were going to be willing to do some very creative things. So you're asking what would be good? Well, there's good in the short term and then there's good in the long term. And, you know, the markets really only care about the very short term these days. So I think if we get if we get the ECB to get very creative, the euro bonds, if maybe we get Draghi or some other person that's put in charge here with with some decent marching orders and instead of what we've got, I think that would be very good short term. Long term, I think if they do that, it'll probably be disastrous for Italy and it will continue to to struggle because the real problems of this economy cannot be solved by just loading more debt and having the government spend more. And I think this is something you were saying, well, what needs to be happening all over the world? We need to get back to some basics here. To grow an economy, you can only do, there's only two ways to grow an economy. You, you grow the labor pool, you grow productivity. Well, growing the labor pool, either you bring in immigration, which is, you know, you want to bring in like the best and the brightest. If your economy is struggling, it's very difficult to get the world's best and the brightest to kind of want to work in your economy. Or you have babies. Well, that's kind of a long term solution. So there's not much we can do on the labor force. What you can do is improve productivity. And productivity isn't really like people think about productivity as like shop floor or something like that, more building more widgets. But that's it's kind of 80s idea on, on productivity. The real, what you get with productivity is information, clarity of data. And what we have seen all over the world is with central banks really mucking with the price of money, that's a very important data point. So there's lack of information and productivity needs good decision making. When you don't have good data coming in, it's very difficult to make good decisions. We've seen post-financial crisis, an incredible explosion in regulation and an increasingly complex tax code that also changes the way people do things. And, and they do things based on these regulations and this tax code. And then that means that the information you're getting in is even more mucked up. So until we start really addressing that those are some of the problems and not the solutions, I think longer term, we're going to see slower and slower economy, which is exactly what we've been seeing. You know, the rise of central banks post Alan Greenspan, when he decided he could just sort of monetary policy away the normal business cycle and get rid of failure, get rid of recessions. After, when we started doing that, and then as we saw more regulation increasingly to complex tax code, economies just growing slower and slower. So with regard to Italy, uh, yeah. you know, if I could boil it down, yeah. it sounds to me like there are only two options. Uh, one is default yeah. and the other is redenomination, which yeah. also might include default. And that, yeah, that would be a default because you, you're, there's no way you're going to pay those euro denominated debts with a lira. But to do that is, I mean, it is going to be so disastrous because just think about all the contracts, like Italian companies, all the contracts that they have, these contracts are all talking about euros. How do you just switch to lira? You know, it's, it's, it's an impossible situation, but it's impossible in either direction which is, I think, why we're going to have to see somebody like a Draghi come in. Maybe we'll have to leave it there uh, with the impossible situation. It's unfortunate, <laughs> but I think, uh, you know, that's how it is. And uh, hopefully yeah. you'll get a little clarity on your lockdown. And, uh, you know, I'd say Godspeed and stay safe. Thank you. Good to talk to you. Hey there, since you got to the end, I'm guessing you liked the video. And that's probably because we don't just turn on a camera and film. We work really hard on getting the narrative flow just right. And that's why many finance companies are actually now hiring Real Vision to make videos for them. One of our recent client videos just hit 100,000 organic views on YouTube, and there were no kittens in sight. So if you want to find out how Real Vision can make a video for your company, just email us at customvideo at realvision.com.